Good afternoon. Uh, after coming here and talking to all these lovely people, I think I've changed a lot of what I wanted to say, but uh, I, th I might have to stick to a little bit just to have the slides in proper sequence. I've been an inventor all of my adult life. In fact, about two or three weeks ago, I was speaking to some people, tech people in Delhi, and after the talk, uh, one guy comes up to me and he says, tell me, what's your mantra? How can you just invent just like that? So the bad news is that I don't have any mantra. But the good news is that everyone can be an inventor because it's just a question of looking for those little signs that nobody else sees and seizing on the opportunity that presents itself to you. This was my first invention. It came about uh, just out of uh, pure curiosity. I went to do some software at an agro firm, and they had a huge machine doing this job. And so I asked whether I could design a machine for them that would do this job, because that big one that they had was 30 feet long and very expensive. And they said, that's the only machine we have. What, what, what can you do? So I said, I made this prototype, and it worked, and it changed their business from two tons a day, they were processing two tons an hour, but a little thing like that. So that was my first machine, but that's just one of many machines and inventions. I won't be talking about all of them, but I just want to talk to you about a few of them. What I actually want to concentrate on is the people and uh, the machines and things that influenced me, things that are inspiring, things that can, you can be inspired with, things that uh, show an interrelationship between a hobby, a passion, something totally unrelated, and something, and in one case, in my case, uh, creativity that stems out of total ignorance. So, basically, for the last six years, I've been working with visually impaired. Now, you heard Chris Downey speak, and I feel a little in, insignificant compared to when you hear people like that, you don't feel adequate enough. But I will talk about my final machine a little later. The reason why I'm, I brought that slide up there, it's, uh, it's the guy who's invented Braille, Louis Braille. And that is the only form of tactile literacy that someone who's blind has. And you might have say mobile phones can speak to them, but what you don't realize is that there's this very significant amount of people who are not just blind, but they're deaf-blind. So they're hearing impaired as well, and they can't use a mobile phone. You can't, if you're blind, you don't really know where to aim your phone if you're using OCR or something to try and figure out what's going on. So maybe you'll be able to listen to someone, but the whole thing about Braille is tactile literacy. It's as important as literacy in any other language or any other script that we are taught. So I'll go back to that, but I'll go back to the subject of Braille, tactile literacy, my most important invention for the last, that I've been working on for the last six years is with, to do with tactile literacy. And uh, I'll go back to that in a little while. But before that, I want to talk to you about something else that is my passion. You mentioned uh, horology. But uh, this is uh, something uh, that inspired Galileo. Now, Galileo was just looking at this oil lamp hanging on an, a chain, blowing in the wind. In those days, they didn't have electricity, so it was an oil lamp. And he noticed that no matter how strong the wind was or how mild it was, the lamp swung with a particular frequency. And he realized that that was basically a measure of time. Time, and he, his mind got working. He analyzed, the, the, and that's pendulum. He analyzed the problem. He realized that, that if that principle that was available in that simple illustration could be harnessed, he could make an accurate timekeeper. And so Galileo made that first clock, which incorporated the use of a pendulum. Very simple observation leading to one of the most profound inventions in history, the art of timekeeping. And uh, those of you who have grown up with mobile phones wouldn't know that uh, horology is a magnificent art. It, it links just not just the mechanics, mastery of mechanical engineering, but it also links art in ways that are totally unbelievable. So. This guy was a guy called John Harrison. I read about him in, in English grade one, uh, English textbook. And from that time, I was inspired. 
that was what a clock looked like. That was, that's an absolute masterpiece. In, in my opinion, I don't think anything has been made that looks as exquisite. It's a mechanical work of art. Not only does it look good, it works beautifully. And in those days, this guy, John Harrison, was ridiculed. He wasn't given anything. But eventually, in his old age, he was recognized for what he did. There are many features in that clock that are still used today. And it is a clock like this that inspired some of the next few of my inventions. Uh, I used to invent just to solve a problem as a, as a sort of a challenge. If I fi found that someone hadn't done something, I could just invent something. But that's not the, I realized that that's not the best way to go about it. You need to invent something, as Thomas Edison said, never invent something that is not going to benefit somebody else. So I stopped inventing just for the sake of inventing. And uh, I invented a perpetual calendar. This is my first invention that earned me money. Now a perpetual calendar is the mechanism that goes into a mechanical watch. And these very high-end watches would have perpetual calendars. They change the date automatically at the end of short months, long months, 28 days, 29 days on leap year, and it does it automatically. And that little simple device does it. And that's an extract from the British Horological Journal that published that. That was one invention. And then subsequently, uh, in the introduction, they said they invented some large date mechanisms. A large date mechanism, this is the internal. This was something that was published in the Horological Journal. And they said, try and figure out how this is done. Now, this is a mechanical counter. A counter is something that counts, like you have counters in your speedometers and things like that. Tachometers, where you have these things that count distance and how many times something's happening. So this is a counter that counts the dates. And uh, unlike normal counters, when it reaches 31, it doesn't go to 32, 33, 34. The units are frozen and the tens advance after 31. So it just counts 1 to 31 without a zero. And that's used in a date mechanism. And with a mechanism like this, you can have a, a date that is about three and a half times larger than a conventional date on, date on a small window on a, on a watch. So I invented three of these things. And uh, some things like that just kept on. I'm not going to talk about any more of those. But John Harrison's clock invented, inspired me and it inspired a lot of other people like me. This is another clock that inspired me. It's a clock designed by a guy called Paul Pouvion. Now, it's significantly more complicated than your mobile phone clocks and watches will ever be. It, it, display, it has 44 different functions that it displays. Perpetual calendar, date, time. There's a thing called sidereal time. That is the time of the revolution of the Earth when measured with respect to the stars, a fixed star, and not respect to the sun. So sidereal time actually varies by about plus or minus 16 minutes with respect to our 24-hour day. And it's only synchronizes with 24 hours twice a year. So this clock measures all that, days of the week, calendar, works. And right on top, this, this is another view. And right on top is what fascinated me most. This is an orrery. And this displays the positions of the planets. Now, you have the Earth going round once in 24 hours, moon going round the Earth in 29 and a half days and a little more than that. And the Earth and Moon in turn go around the Sun, and the planets in turn all go around the Sun at the exact period. So you can predict exactly where some planet is going to be, where the Earth is, what's the phases of the Moon, a whole lot of things on this one clock. It was, this guy started making it in 1930, and he finished in 1939. But it's such a masterpiece that uh, the person who gave me permission, and he's become a friend of mine now, Mark Frank, he was so inspired that he commissioned a clock. And he's, after studying all these beautiful clocks all around the world, he commissioned a masterpiece. It took two years to design. And he started in 2006 with some guys who are masters at their craft. And he started this. And now this clock can do all that Pouvion's clock can do and more. It contains more of the features that are found there. And it has the features of Harrison's H1, which I showed you right in the beginning that inspired me. It has everything is uh, uh, an example of mastery in that particular field. Even the dials are enameled, beautiful works of art. It has an orrery, and it's going to be completed in 2017. It's still not complete. 
It's, it's an absolutely beautiful clock. This is another view. And uh, for those of you who, like, who might want to take up mechanical engineering, this is what it looks like on the inside. And, and uh, if you think uh, a Ferrari engine is complicated or something like that, I asked Mark how many parts go into this. He said if you count every single part, there's over 9,000 parts. 9,000. And there are 390 geared wheels in something like this. Now, when you see something like this, you cannot help but come away inspired and inspired for life. You just have to come face to face with something like this. And you know you've met the ultimate. And so the only option is to use them as a benchmark for what you want to do in future. And so this is Mark's clock. That's another view of a prototype that was made just to get an idea of what it's going to look like. And uh, it's still not complete. 2017 is when it's scheduled for completion. Now, another person who was one of my heroes 250 years ago, Brege, Abraham Louis Brege. I got the privilege when I designed that perpetual calendar. This company, Brege, invited me to Switzerland. I got to see some of their works of art. And uh, this watch, 250 years ago, it's not just a work of art, it's a mechanical masterpiece, but what you can see is pure art. And this, the inventions that went into a clock like this are evident even in the, uh, the, the waves that you can see below the blue on the enamel of the dial. Now, this was not designed for a blind person in mind because this was meant for royalty, but uh, this clock was meant so that you could feel the time in the dark. Uh, in those days, they had no electricity, so if you had to tell the diamond in the dark, you had to light an oil lamp or a candle. But this one, you could actually feel it. It was called a mantra tact. That means a tactile watch. And this led to further inventions that uh, helped make this an artistic masterpiece in itself. There's a type of engraving that's just under the blue enamel called Gyoshe. And that's an invention that produced uh, engraving of geometric patterns on metal. And that's evident in this watch, again by Louis Brege. It's under the dial. Everything handmade in those days. Beautiful inventions that are still unsurpassed even today for the high precision watch mechanisms. Uh, I, I'm not going to dwell too much on the subject of horology. I'm going back to the blindness. But before that, these are two from my personal collection. Because these are also works of art. You were talking to me about art, and you wanted to do art, and this is um, the ultimate as far as art. This is hand engraved watch cases. But now they're doing them with machines that have been done, but you can't still get this type of effect. There are a lot of inventions. One invention leads to another, to another, to another, and it's a mixture, a blend of art and the ultimate of engineering, both going together. But before that, I'm going back now to my topic. As Chris Downey said, that's a far more important topic than my subject of horology. But horology was, gave me the foundation that I needed for this last set of projects that I'm working on. That's a page of Braille. And Braille is the set of raised and box dots. But before I go into that, I just wanted to Chris Downey said, design for the blind. And uh, I'm just going to show you something for designing for the blind. These two animals, how would you describe them to, if you had a blind friend? How would you describe them to someone who's blind? You tell them, okay, the horse looks like a zebra. I mean, a zebra looks like a horse, but it doesn't look like that's a bongo, the other animal. And you say, the bongo looks like a zebra, but its stripes are different. The stripes are different color, but the zebra doesn't look like the bongo. The bongo has horns, the zebra doesn't. The horse doesn't have stripes, but it looks like the zebra. I mean, they get terribly confused. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because that's the level of confusion our government is actually imposing on our blind people today with our currency. I mean, we find it difficult with even the coins to identify the differences in coins. But for notes, it's a very big problem. They've put in little symbols. I was just showing them to someone earlier. They've put in little symbols, square, circle, a rectangle, and a dash to identify the different currency notes. Those are supposed to be tactile. But at the scale they've done it, you can't feel the difference. You can't distinguish a shape by feeling it at that scale. So they haven't really consulted someone who's blind. They haven't really designed for the blind in mind. They've, it's very good intentions, but it's very badly designed. 
And how I knew that was because a friend of mine, Tafil, a little young girl who's blind, she said, Paul, design something for us to help us identify currency notes. And so I came up with a little template called, uh, I called it a Tiffy template. It's a little piece, like a credit card, who won't know how to find it with this template. Because our 10s and 20s are the same width. And they're just fractionally different in length. Our 50s and 20s are the same length, but they're in different width. So they get very confused. And our 100s are, of course, a little, 150, our 500s are very close in length, but uh, they're the same width. So it's confusing for everybody. But with this, they could identify it. And this is a very simple invention that uh, helps you. It just requires folding the note on the bottom and feeling around. And the braille symbols tell them what to do. That's just something new, so it's not really reached the market. I just give it to my blind friends. Oh. Okay, now, now thank, thank you very much. But now for those who uh, do not feel that they've got this inventive spirit, spirit of creativity in them, I want to give you hope because this most significant invention of mine, the, let's call it a refreshable braille display, came about totally, it was conceived in ignorance. I'm still, I, I don't really know braille, but my machine is about braille. Uh, I don't know, really know music, uh, but the music, trying to understand that music and how it's written, that was what inspired me to actually develop this braille uh, display that I've done. So when I was listening to this, when this Titanic was singing, beautiful hymn being played, and I was running my fingers over this music score, trying to figure out how, what, what those little symbols were and how they were related to the sound I was hearing and how a musician interprets a sound. I, I couldn't figure that out. I still don't know how that works. But I was inspired by the thought that if those dots, I mean, those symbols changed into dots, then someone who's blind would be able to read music. And so then the next logical thing is, how do you make the dots come out of the page? And so uh, I spent some time trying to convince people that I, I designed something, but nobody believed it could be done. Everybody who I went through, 63 attempts, I think I tried more than that and I got more discouragement. They, they just told me it could not be done. You can't alter the scale of Braille. Braille has a 2.5 millimeter dot pitch. And just for one line of 20 characters, there are 120 actuators. You can't scale down mechanics to that level and control all 120 pins. So, but I, I thought, I mean, it didn't appear to me as a problem because I had designed it and I'm trying to convince them that I've done it and they don't believe me. I said, this is ridiculous. But fortunately, the government of India had a competition in National Geographic shaping the future and the judges were some scientists from the DSIR and they said, submit us a proposal and uh, we'll fund your project. And so they did that. And uh, this is a working prototype. You can see the braille changing on the top. It's changing in real life, in real time. And so what it does is it actually takes digital information and converts it into braille. So you don't need big, massive braille books. You can have all your study material on a little device like that and just keep reading Braille. And the next version, you can type and store your notes. And you don't need a recorder. You don't need a scribe. Because if they do the exams here, they, the invigilator doesn't need to know Braille. They can read it on our text. And the day the question paper in text comes in Braille. It's, it makes life so easy. And that's basically to read because they know when this line has changed. It's just, it just requires uh, pressing of a button and the data changes. It just goes to the next line and you can read books. So that's what I've been doing. But before I close, I just want to close with a quote which uh, was written by a chap called Gordon uh, Rattray. Uh, just a minute. I'm not good with my memory. Gordon Rattray Taylor. It's from a book called Inventions That Change the World. And this is something to you. Invention springs from a divine discontent with things the way they are and a conviction that man can do better. It is a conviction we must, should all do utmost to foster. And that is Gordon Rattray Taylor, who said uh, this in the foreword of his book, Inventions That Change the World. And there's just one more thing. Creative thinking may, be simply, uh, may simply mean the realization that there is no particular virtue in doing things the way they have always been done before. And that is Rudolf Flesch. Thank you.